Good evening, everybody. My name is Tim Lancaster. I am the Dean of Medical Education at GKT School of Medical Education, and uh, it's my pleasant task uh, to introduce the speaker for tonight's fourth annual Peter Sowerby Lecture. Uh, the Peter Sowerby Lecture is a project of the History and Philosophy Project here at King's, very generously supported by the Peter Sowerby Foundation, uh, which is a charity devoted to supporting healthcare research, provision, education, community, and environmental projects. Now, uh, before I introduce this evening's speaker, Sir Ian Chalmers, uh, I want to hand over to Alexander Kerr, <coughs> who is the Peter Sowerby Professor of Health and Philosophy, who is going to tell us about another project that has been running involving uh, an essay prize, and I believe that we have the announcement of a winner at the essay prize for 2018. Thanks, Thanks very much indeed, Tim. Um, so, so alongside the, this lecture, we run an annual essay contest, um, which is open to students and alumni of all the University of London schools and colleges, graduate and undergraduate, um, medical and professional, the, the whole the whole range. So you know, open to a large constituency, um, and the essays are on a topic connected with the topic of that year's uh, lecture. So this this year we set the topic as uh, "Doctor, will my treatment make me better?" Who is responsible for reducing uncertainties about the effects of treatment? And this year's uh, winner is Mr. Ben Jones. Um, ben gave his essay the title, The Science and the Art of Medicine, uh, The Physician's Responsibility to Reduce Treatment Uncertainties, which dealt with both the uncertainties arising from incomplete knowledge of the effects of a treatment on a patient and also the uncertainties that can arise from an inadequate grasp of the patient's values and needs. Anyway, it was an excellent essay, and many congratulations, Ben. As I say, it's a real pleasure and a privilege to uh, be able to introduce Ian Chalmers, who I've known for the last 25 years. Uh, Ian trained as a doctor in London in the 1960s and worked as a clinician in London and also for a period of time in the Gaza Strip. And I, my impression, Ian, is that latter period has always been, I've had the impression that was a formative period in your career. Um, but uh, moving on to the 1970s, he moved away from direct clinical care to becoming a full-time health system service uh, researcher with a particular interest in the effects of care. And um, perhaps I could take a further personal note for a minute. Um, I was a student, medical student here at Guy's in the 1970s and 1980s. And um, after a period of doing a number of other things, uh, including developing an interest in what was then the relatively new field of clinical epidemiology and, and evidence-based healthcare. I returned uh, to Guy's in 1991 as the SHO in obstetrics and gynecology. Uh, the reason for that was that I was retraining as a GP. So I needed to pick up obs and gyne again, not having done it uh, for 10 years since I was a medical student. But, uh, during my time as a medical student, I was ex extremely frustrated by the quality of the textbooks. Actually, not only in obstetrics and gynecology, it'd be wrong to target them alone. But, uh, generally speaking, uh, medical te textbooks at the time struck me as rather dogmatic and opinion-based, perhaps particularly in obstetrics and gynecology. So um, <coughs> I was preparing to come back and do ONG again after a long break. Uh, I was looking around for something to read, having rather low expectations of what might be out there. And to my amazement and delight, I came across a book called Infective Care in Pregnancy and Childbirth, uh, which had been uh, edited by Ian and others, 
based on, I think, over a decade's work, um, collecting and systematically analyzing the evidence for interventions in obstetrics. And uh, the book was a revelation to me. Uh, there was no anecdote. It was based on analysis of evidence where it existed and where evidence did not exist. It stated that. It was to me an entirely different form of textbook. And really sustained me through that six months of uh, obstetrics and gynecology. Here. Lo and behold, six months later, I found myself at a lunch party in Oxford uh, where I met Ian Chalmers. Uh, who told me at that time that uh, he was moving on from the field of perinatal epidemiology to try and do the same thing that he'd done for women's health in the rest of healthcare. And that was the first I had heard of what we now know as the Cochrane Collaboration. Uh, it was a very exciting time in healthcare and one which I willingly joined uh, and became myself member of the Cochrane Collaboration. And what was exciting about it was not only that we were doing something good in terms of trying to make healthcare more evidence-based and give patients and doctors the ability to reduce the kind of uncertainty that Alexander was referring to, but also because it was uh, an organization at that time based completely on uh, volunteerism, collaboration and idealism. Most of the people who gathered at that first meeting in 1992, I think, were not being paid anything to be there, and uh, uh, they were there simply through idealism and wanting to do something good. Uh, so Ian was instrumental in that, developing the, Co the Cochrane Collaboration and inspiring hundreds, well, many thousands of us to go on and, and participate. And we now have the Cochrane Library as a testament to all that work and enthusiasm. But uh, I should mention that he had a very unusual tactic for um, people who expressed an interest in joining this collaboration at the beginning. What he would do is sit you down and he'd say, I'm, I'm sort of interested in this Cochrane collaboration, maybe doing a Cochrane review. And he'd sit down and he'd say, it's very hard work. You won't be able to get rid of it. You'll have to keep on updating it forever. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it unless you're absolutely sure. And, and actually, it's a, a testament to that strategy that so many of us did decide that it was the right thing to do. And it's been a really important part of my career and many others like me. So, Ian, I haven't mentioned what you've been doing since the Cochrane Collaboration, uh, but I'm sure that that will come out as in your talk, and we're delighted to have you here at King's. I should also finally mention that I met Ian at another lunch party a few weeks ago when he told me that he is no longer giving talks. So he has made a specific exception for this evening, uh, and I think we're all absolutely delighted that you've made that exception, Ian. Welcome to King's. Thank you very much indeed, Tim, and thank you for your contributions to what we know about how to help people stop smoking, because you took on, which must be one of the most important challenges facing uh, the health professions and the uh, individuals who are smokers, you did the most fantastic job in reviewing with your colleagues what was known about that, so many thanks for your support. Um, and thanks to Alex for the invitation to come here. The reason that I said yes, because I gave up giving talks about 18 months ago, was that I was trying to get an article out of him. And I said I would do it um, as long as he could produce this article on a man called James Durin, which will, in time for the talk. And um, we published it on the James Lynn Library uh, about five days ago. So he made it just in time, but I've, I've had my pound of flesh from, from, from him. Um, I've looked into Peter Sowerby a bit, um, and all I can say is that my impression from what I've read is that 
he had a different impression of the value of um, PSA screening for prostate cancer from mine. I would never have it done to me at all. He seems to think it's a good idea. Uh, so it seems a shame that I have to be giving a talk named for him in which the only thing I've been able to find out with some certainty is that we probably disagreed. Um, the last thing I want to say is that I'm particularly glad that um, two friends have come here. Um, one of them um, is a PhD candidate in King's, the other is from UCL, um, Department of Biochemistry. Uh, Shaima al Wahedi is studying um, the reasons why the outcome for breast cancer in the Gaza Strip, which is her home, is so appalling and doing very important work under extremely difficult circumstances and must be very worried for her family uh, in the light of um, recent days, particularly the last three or four days. Uh, and then um, Phoebe Marson smith um, is here also she has done an important update of a survey that um, Philip Alderson and myself did about 10 years ago showing that people are still claiming that they have, they have proven a negative. Uh, as This is a philosophical issue basically that um, uh, it is not the same thing to say um, there is no effect as it is to say we have been able to detect an effect. And this mistake continues to be made on a very wide scale and Sophie has done a review um, of this bad practice, basically. They need a few more philosophers, I would imagine, in, uh, in the journal editorial departments. So, um, those of you who had um, read anything about what I was going to say this evening will gather that it harks back to um, uh, an article that was published um, in the BMJ, which I wrote uh, 25 or so years ago, um, saying, what do I want from research and researchers when I'm a patient? I thought I ought to put myself in that uh, position. So it happens that I start off, I found this out only in the last um, uh, week or two, that there are three 20ths of May that are significant. One um, represents a causal association. Uh, the other one is a coincidence, which again is all to do with philosophy, as far as I'm concerned. James Lind was a Scottish naval surgeon, and he was confused by the varying claims made for different treatments for uh, the actually often lethal disease of scurvy. It was killing far more um, British Royal Navy uh, sailors than it was, uh, than was um, enemy action. And so he set up a controlled trial which began on the 20th of May 1747. And he took 12 patients and th these are important points which will recur in the, what I have to say. As similar as I could have them they lay together in one place and they had one diet common to all. And then he allocated two of them to each of six treatments. And as you'll see at the bottom, the most sudden and visible good effects were perceived from the use of oranges and lemons. So a European clinical research group decided in 2005 that it would be nice to have a day every year where clinical trials would be celebrated for the important um, uh, type of study that they are. And so they decided it should be the 20th of May, 2005, um, and indeed it has been since, uh, sorry, the 20th of May, and it has been that since 2005. But then, quite by chance, I found out that this article that I wrote in 1995 had been published on the 20th of May. It was absolutely nothing to do with, uh, the, I'm sure the editors of the BMJ took absolutely no account uh, of what had gone before. So I thought that when um, Alexander asked me if I would um, give a talk, that it might be of interest to me 
and I hope it may be to you, to look back at this article um, and to um, see how much of what I suggested in it held up for me. Remember, I'm talking about my personal wishes. I'm not saying that any of this applies to any of you as individuals. This is what I want from health research and, and researchers, and I will try to explain why as I go through. But I had to start off by acknowledging I'm a bit of a peculiar patient. I mean, I'm getting old, and in that sense, wheels keep on falling off, um, and uh, the things that do happen to old people are happening to me. But I was um, unusual uh, because of my background in health services research. Uh, I was paid, I think it was 20 pounds to model for this um, advertisement, which was to raise money for um, the United Nations Association. And as you'll see, it implies that if you put on a white coat and have a stethoscope round your neck, you can be defined as a do-gooder. That was um, a lie. Um, learning that good intentions are not good enough um, while trying to do um, uh, more good than harm was what I learned. And here's just one example. I could give you lots of examples. Um, using this book, I advised parents to put their babies to sleep on their tummies. And it was because inside it, this very popular book had recommended, I think it's preferable to a customer baby to sleeping on his stomach from the start. If he's willing, he may change later if he learns to turn over. This was disastrous and non-evidence-based advice. It was based on theory, not empirical evidence. It resulted in tens of thousands of avoidable deaths in late infancy. An estimated 10,000 in this country alone so a really serious way of killing babies inadvertently. People think in terms of complicated operations or dangerous drugs, but you can do it with advice. And this is a good example. Um, Anne Diamond's um, baby, Sebastian, died in late infancy from cot death. And she helped with a campaign. Uh, it was run in about five different countries, the Back to Sleep campaign, advising parents to put their babies to sleep on their back. And what you saw was, as sleeping position changed, so the infant mortality uh, came down. Very important discovery, which could have been made earlier if people had done systematic reviews. So th this is just one example from my early career of a recognition that it's very important to get reliable assessment of the effects of treatments, interventions. When I say treatments, I mean any sort of intervention which is meant to protect health, improve health, um, restore health, or help people who have got a health problem which can't be relieved, but to make their life more comfortable. And I want to give four examples um, from critical care medicine because it could happen to any of us. It could happen to me um, uh, as I cross the road to go back to Oxford. Any of these things might happen to any of us. So I've taken these four examples of treatments which have been around and being used for ages. So where do we start? Oxygen. Very common picture to see someone with an oxygen mask on in dramas about um, critical care. Well. In earlier this year, a systematic review of the control trials was done, which shows that liberal oxygen therapy actually increases mortality. Who would have thought that the life-giving gas, oxygen, actually had the capacity to kill people? Actually, it's not innocuous. Oxygen in high doses blinded babies. Stevie Wonder was blinded as a premature baby uh, by too much oxygen. What about adrenaline for cardiac arrest? Well, a study was actually set up in this country and a randomized comparison of adrenaline versus placebo. And it was the researchers were criticized for withholding adrenaline from people who were going into this trial. But it actually got 
the results got published in the um, New England Journal of Medicine. And it did show that um, with cardiac arrest, there was a slightly increased, mortality, uh, increased uh, survival with the people who had the adrenaline. The trouble, for me anyway, is that more survivors had se severe neurological impairment uh, in the adrenaline group. I mean, to put it bluntly, don't give me adrenaline if I have a cardiac arrest going up these stairs on the way of it. I, I don't want it. I'd rather die quickly, thank you very much, than end up neurologically impaired. What about colloids for hypovolemic shock? The idea that these were useful came during the uh, Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor when seven um, bur badly burned sailors were given albumin reconstituted from dried albumin as a fluid um, for resuscitation. And that led to a fashion for giving albumin and other um, types of colloids. Um, it seemed logical, uh, but what did the first Cochrane Review show? It actually showed that more of the patients receiving albumin colloids died as compared to those receiving in essence, salt water, <coughs> normal saline, ringer's lactate, something like that. Um, the use with that Cochrane Review, the use in this country dropped dramatically, as you can see it when it's published. <coughs> also, some money was saved because it's very expensive by comparison with the alternative. And there's this rather pathetic um, comment by the Committee on Safety of Medicine Patients should be reassured if they have received albumin treatment and survived. <laughs> that is a direct quote. So now what we have with some more, it stimulated some more trials, which is good. The Australians and New Zealanders were the first people to do a um, decent sized trial. The current situation, this is the August 2018 update of that review basically just shows that there's no advantage of this, uh, these alternatives to salt water uh, and they cost uh, up to 20 times as much. So they're just wasting money if they're being used now. They are in Gaza, by the way. Um, they're, they're wasting money on this and Gaza is not the sort of place that can waste money. There isn't enough of it around. So what about steroids for acute traumatic brain injury? Well, a review was done and it revealed important uncertainty. Uh, the data suggested it could either reduce or increase uh, the risk of death following acute traumatic brain injury. This was handled very appropriately by Ian Roberts and his colleagues at the London School of Hygiene. Because this systematic review and also a survey of clinical practice had shown variation in practice, some people gave the stuff, other people didn't, there was uncertainty, and it was an important one because uh, brain injury is very common, with, uh, particularly with increased uh, motorized traffic. And so a large, publicly funded, multi-center, randomized trial was organized. It was registered prospectively. The protocol of the trial was published. This was the published report. 10,000 patients took part in it. Basically, that was the front cover of The Lancet in which it was published. This treatment had been killing people for about 30 years, something like that. Now, I don't know whether people are still being given it, but they certainly shouldn't be, because this is the evidence which shows that it's a dangerous thing to do. So, the report of that trial, it's called the CRASH trial, is exemplary because it refers to current uncertainty, it registers the trial and publishes the protocol, it sets the new results of an updated systematic, in an updated uh, systematic review of all of the evidence and it provides readers with all of the evidence needed for action. Exemplary. This was a con uh, the conclusions of analysis of a, a very important medical textbook, uh, the textbooks rather, they've surveyed several of them. Their conclusion was advice on some life-saving therapies has been delayed for more than a decade while other treatments have been recommended long after controlled research has shown them to be harmful. And I'm looking forward to reading Ben's essay because no doubt he had to grapple with some of these things. I'm going to be interested to read what conclusions he came to. 
Um, I had to give um, evidence to a House of Lords committee on medical research and I mentioned the lethal nature of the Oxford textbook of medicine uh, in one uh, particular respect. Um, they had um, basically dismissed um, clot busting drugs for um, heart attack uh, in the 1987 edition and I suggested to the committee that th this was lethal advice in a major textbook. Um, the Sunday Times, I didn't realize, was so naive, I didn't realize there was some journalist there who was going to put me on the front page of the Sunday Times the, the subsequent weekend. But as you can imagine, it didn't make colleagues in Oxford particularly happy. Um, the most interesting comment, in fact, was that um, it came from Oxford University Press, who published the, Cox, the, um, the Oxford Textbook of Medicine. They said that my comments had disturbed the market. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? You know, we think of drug companies being baddies, but what about publishers? Um, so conclusions, as far as I'm concerned, are that the patients and the public suffer when known uncertainties about the effects of treatments are not addressed in rigorous research. And I know that there is there's a module um, in the um, program that you're responsible for, uh, Alexander, which addresses some of these issues, which is, I was very pleased to read that. If any of you haven't seen the um, only creditworthy contribution to history made by Donald Rumsfeld, uh, it's worthwhile repeating it because it, it is very, very good. Believe it or not, the Plain English Society criticized him for it, but it's actually very good. As we know, there are no knowns. There are known unknowns. And there are also unknown unknowns. And it is very important to recognize all of these different forms of, um, particularly the, I've been talking mainly about the second category, the known unknowns, with those systematic reviews and the randomized trials, uh, reducing the unknownness of it. But then there are things that we haven't even thought of that need to be considered. So, what do I want from research as a patient and why? Well, I want decisions about my health care to be informed by relevant evidence about the effects of treatments. And that means doing research which is addressing questions that are of interest to me, the answers of which are of interest to me, using outcome measures that are of interest to me. I'm not interested in experiments which only look at some blood measure which goes up or, or, or down. I want something which is a, a more direct measure of health that preferably that I can appreciate through uh, reduced symptoms or whatever. Um, I felt and said in the article 20, whenever it was, 25 years ago, that I felt that health researchers could serve the in, uh, interests of the public more effectively by greater lay involvement in planning and promoting health research. I thought that um, patients had things to offer uh, in that respect. And we founded the James Lind Alliance, which was to get um, <coughs> patients and clinicians together, not just patients. I don't like the idea of public and, public and uh, what's it called, patient and public involvement or engagement. There are two sides to a consultation, the clinicians and patients. And we wanted to get them to work together to identify what they thought were the most crucial uh, un, uh, uncertainties in the fields in which they were, uh, had an interest. So the first one was in asthma, then there was one in urinary incontinence, there have been in some in schizophrenia, over, six, uh, over 60 different things of these priority setting partnerships were done. And these four people um, uh, managed this program. Very exciting people, the three on the, on the top. Patricia Atkinson is my administrative colleague. Sally Crow, Lester Ferkins, and Catherine Cowan are all extremely good facilitators. They get people talking to each other who, when these exercises start, don't necessarily have the right approach to listening to other people's views very, very good indeed. There's, it's been going now um, since uh, 20, 2004. Um, 
And we did it because, you know, having spent a year in the Cochrane collaboration, I think Tim might agree with this, there's so much crap research. Research which is not only not done well, but addressing questions that no one is interested in. One wonders how on earth things, so much bad research is done, irrelevant research. And it's probably to decorate people's curricula vitae, or they want something to add to an application for promotion or something like that. But it's such a shame that so much resource is wasted uh, in crap research of no interest to patients. This uh, is just an example of an analysis which shows that there is this gap. Um, let me just concentrate on the green bar. So we looked at all of the, the, um, uh, the priority setting partnerships that had been done up until the time that this review was done. Um, and we compared the uh, interventions that they um, wanted to see evaluated coming out of those um, priority setting partnerships with what trialists were actually doing, both um, commercial trials and non-commercial trials. And what you see is there was this great interest, nearly 70% seven, is it? Anyway, um, whatever the, 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 I think it may be numbers rather than things, but education, training, service delivery, psychological interventions, physical interventions, exercise, complementary therapies, diet, and other things were the things that um, the punters, the patients, wanted to see addressed. In some senses, unsurprisingly, um, uh, a very, very small proportion of those trials funded by the um, industry were interested in those, even as comparators to drug treatments. Um, it was a little bit better for the publicly funded uh, trials. So what else do I want from research as a patient and why? I want decisions about my health care to be informed by reliable evidence about the effects of treatments. And for me, this is just for me, I don't make any claims beyond me, this will usually mean evidence from systematic reviews of research designed to minimize the effects of biases and the play of chance. So, we share an interest, uh, Alexandra and me, in epistemology and in history. And I had to learn something about philosophy before coming here, and there was this small contribution on epistemology. All you really need to know about it, uh, epistemology is how to spell it, uh, but how can we know what we know, uh, how can we know that we know that is effective at times but mustn't be overused. Um, but that's what I think both of us are interested. We're interested in how do people come to conclusions that they have arrived at knowledge from um, empirical observations and logic. I believe that fair treatment comparisons and sufficient numbers of observations are, are needed for reliable identification of treatment effects. However, through seeking we may learn and know things better, but as for certain truth, no man hath known it, for all is but a woven web of guesses. Um, a philosopher, an ancient one. Here's a, a more modern epidemiological philosopher. Our many errors have shown that the practice of causal inference remains an art. Although to assist us we have acquired analytic techniques, statistical methods and conventions and logical criteria, ultimately the conclusions we reach are a matter of judgment. So I'm one of those people who's prepared to acknowledge that although I have certain criteria for judging whether uh, information is sufficiently reliable for me, I wouldn't ever claim that um, I had arrived at the truth or I had seen the truth from the investigations that I might make uh, as a patient. So I'm going to take you through some of these um, criteria because they've been around for a long time. I'm not the only person who's proposing these things. Who knows what's happening here? I don't see a single arm oh, going up. Guess, someone guess. Is it treat, treat, Sorry? Is it treat, 
Pretty close. It's a dislocated jaw, and this is how you uh, reduce the, uh, the dislocation. You pull the mandible forward and then slip it back into its um, sockets. Now, as it, and it's dramatic. You don't need carefully controlled research to show that this is an effective treatment for this condition. You don't need to worry about um, um, size of the studies, you know, how long it's being done, how many replications and so on. Sometimes it won't work, but the effect when it happens is so dramatic. Now, isn't it interesting that that has actually was described 1500 years before the Common Era? In, first of all, in Hieratic, but as most people don't read Hieratic, I've translated it into hieroglyphic for you, <laughs> which is read by far more people. But basically, um, in this Edwin Smith Surgical Papyrus, um, translated by John Nunn, a doctor who used to work at um, Hammersmith Hospital, um, they just describe what you were seeing on that earlier um, thing. So it's been around for a long time as something which is um, um, a reliable treatment in, in the main. But the effects of most treatments are moderate or non-existent. And without fair comparisons based on sufficient observations, the effects of treatments are difficult to distinguish from the effects of biases and the play of chance. This man, Abu Bakr Muhammad ibn Zakaria al-Razi, who was a Persian working in Baghdad um, in the 9th century, um, he was um, interested in... Um, how best to treat people who had incipient meningitis. And here he describes, um, um, if you see someone with uh, neck stiffness, uh, fever, headache, uh, photophobia, um, you should make a diagnosis of um, um, meningitis, he called it brain fever, um, and you should proceed to bloodletting. Now, we probably wouldn't accept that that was the best guess these days. But the important thing is, he once saved one group of patients by it, while he intentionally neglected to bleed another group. By doing that, I wish to reach a conclusion. He was making a formal comparison, and he was making an inference from that formal co comparison that he should choose bloodletting in those circumstances. And it was, it's the knowledge that he needed to do something like that to produce reliable evidence that's the important thing about this very early example. However, I'm going to rush forward to the beginning of the 18th century because this is where it all starts. Um, it was at a time where smallpox epidemics were having a big toll where they existed. And the thought was, the idea had actually come from Turkey, that if you used um, smallpox scabs to make a, a little incision, um, inoculate basically, you could give people a mild dose of smallpox which would protect them in, a, in a, an epidemic from getting the full-blown disease. So um, this um, particular report uh, was a work done by Dr. Nettleton in Halifax um, and he sent it as a letter to the um, Secretary of the Royal Society, James Durin. And uh, he, he says it can, the, the, um, whether the, the, the inoculation is as dangerous or possibly even more dangerous than the natural disease can only by, uh, be found by making a comparison absolutely key, the idea that you need to make a comparison. So he collected statistics and found out how many had died from the natural disease. And he went around the, the, um, the, the country a bit. He went into Cheshire to Stockport and Macclesfield. Don't know where Hatherfield is, but he had quite a few from Yorkshire. And what he found was, when he looked at them all together, there was about getting off for a 20% mortality from natural smallpox. So he, he recognized the need for comparisons based on sufficient numbers of observations and
calculated that almost 19 out of every 100, near one-fifth of those who had the natural smallpox had died. But of those who were inoculated, none of them had developed the, the disease. Now, he, he, as, as I mentioned previously, he uh, wrote his findings for James Durin, the secretary of the, the Royal Society, who published a further account um, in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. And he took Nettleton's figures, the 3,405 in Yorkshire, but then he added um, uh, two more series, one from uh, Chichester and the other from Haverford West in West Wales. And they found, found a similar mortality rate was confirmed in Chichester and Haverford West. But out of 82 persons who had had the smallpox by inoculation the same year and in the neighborhood, same neighborhood, so um, not one miscarried. So he's, he's thinking comparatively, but also uh, in terms of making a fair comparison same year, same location. Now, on the basis of that, I'd just like a show of hands if you were in, uh, in the 18th century, in the early 18th century, and there was a smallpox epidemic gather gathering speed. Will people who would like to have inoculation in those circumstances put up their hands, please? Would anyone who didn't put up their hand and who did not want it, in other words, I don't want to look at the uncertain ones, that's fair enough, anyone who actually wanted not to have this, would you explain what was the deficiency in the evidence that made you feel that way? No? Okay, never mind. Um, there's a wonderful article <laughs> written about this story by one Alexander Bird. Uh, it was published about four days ago and it is uh, freely available on the James Lynn Library which is a, um, you can go into it, it's open access and um, Alexander is the, um, um, if you search, put it in the, in, the, in the search window, Bird, you'll get straight to it. It's a very nice article. So I came, eventually. <laughs> um, right, recognition of the need for fair comparison. So this guy, Isaac Massey, felt that um, inoculation was interfering in, the, in the, the, um, the, do the doings of God. So he made the objection that if the comparison is going to be just, then the circumstances of the patients must and ought to be as near as possible on a par. So he was actually talking about the need for the comparison groups to be similar in all res uh, respects except for the use of inoculation, which is fair enough. It's an important patient, um, uh, principle to uh, emphasize. So recognition of the need to compare like with like is another part of this story which is very important. And so I turn to a poet now, who got there long before some doctors, um, Petrarch, who in a letter to a fellow poet called Boccaccio, said this, I solemnly affirm and believe if a hundred or a thousand men of the same age, same temperament, same surroundings, were attacked at the same time by the same disease, in other words, on a par, one half followed the prescriptions of the doctors, the other half relied on nature's instincts, he had no doubt as to which half would escape. I leave it to you to decide what he was referring to there. So here's an example, a bit like James Lind, same this, same that, same that, the other, to get a fair comparison. <coughs> so how do you actually achieve sameness, not only in terms of things that you have measured, like where they live or how sick they are, but on things you haven't measured. Well, there's a wonderful device called alternation. I'll come to random allocation in a moment, but alternation will do just fine. 
Alexander Lassasse Hamilton um, was a military doctor in the Peninsular War. It was he who named himself the most beautiful man in existence. And he was quite a bounder, he cheated on his wife, but he actually was very obsessional about collecting statistics. And as part of his MD thesis for the University of Edinburgh, he did a controlled trial. And here's his description. It was published in Latin. Don't know what happened there, but it wasn't anything that I intended should happen. Right. Neither Mr. Anderson nor I ever once employed the Lancet for bloodletting. Uh, actually, I'll go back just to show you. It was quite a large sample. 366 was admitted alternately in such a manner that each of us, three of these three surgeons, had one third of the whole. The sick were indiscriminately received, no um, selection, and were attended as near as possible with the same care and accommodated with the same comforts. Neither Mr. Anderson nor I ever once employed the Lancet. He lost two, I four cases. Whilst out of the other third, treated with bloodletting by the third surgeon, 35 patients died. Tenfold increased mortality with uh, bloodletting, which continued, bloodletting did, on the advice of very senior um, medical um, teachers like Sir William Osler into the beginning of the 20th century. Controlled trial done in 1854 to test claims which were around at that time that um, you could protect children from getting um, scarlet fever by administering belladonna, atropine. So he did this, this guy did a, um, a study. He was the um, medical officer in charge of a um, military uh, orphanage uh, in London. He went on to become president of the Royal Statistical Society, so he was probably pretty, he'd been thinking about these things. And so there were 151 boys of whom I had tolerably satisfactory evidence that they had not had scarlatina. In other words, they were uh, um, liable to get it if they were exposed. I divided them into two sections, taking them alternately from the list. And this is the key um, uh, phrase, to prevent the implication of selection. In other words, taking them alternately, you take account not only of things, their age, their general um, state of health, but things that you don't know are important yet, let alone have measured. That's what alternation and randomization achieve for you. They protect you against your incomplete knowledge about the things that actually affect prognosis. This wonderful um, philosopher uh, from Aberdeen um, pointed out when he was thinking statistically, and this was in um, this was about 20 years later after um, Graham Balfour had reported what I just showed you. There should always be obtained, if possible, a parallel statistics, cases with and cases without the treatment in question. So you can see how by the middle of the um, uh, 19th century, many people were beginning to get the hang of what was to become a way of um, looking at testing treatments. And indeed, when in 1995, we did an analysis of just something over 30,000 um, patients who had been treated in, I think, 250 randomized controlled trials. And we looked at the relationship between the, the results, on average, in three groups. Those where it was claimed that random allocation had been used. Those where um, it was clear that random allocation had not been used. And those where it was just difficult to um, uh, um, determine one way or the other. Basically, it shows that you got better results, in inverted commas, if you didn't randomize, almost certainly because of um, selection bias. Th this um, paper, actually, I'm very pleased to say, I'm, I'm the only non-statistician on it, and we got a, we got a prize from clinic, the, what's it called, the um, Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. We were very pleased by that. Um, and it was allocation concealment that we pointed out that was very important in that. Um, 
another paper um, showed how there's been this burgeoning, um, not just of systematic reviews, like James Durin's systematic review, but also of um, randomized trials. And depending wh uh, where you look, you get slightly different um, uh, absolute numbers, but what you do get is a strong impression that both of these things are becoming more common. I leave this for you to read. Uh, remember it's being written by, in fact he's a clinical pharmacologist at UCL, I think um, someone that Phoebe knows or will get to know, but have a look at what he had to say. And, you know, as in all professions, uh, there are people who command respect, frankly, and other people who don't. Um, and that's important to recognize. The um, philosophers are not always the fount of wisdom. Right, I want to give examples of my use of systematic reviews and large randomized trials. Apologies if this sounds too personal, but I just want to say I'm trying to practice what I've said I think are important. When I got invited to uh, participate in the colorectal um, cancer screening program, I looked up the randomized, the, the um, systematic review. It seemed to me to be uh, a good bet. I've been, um, uh, being, I've been participating in it ever since. Screening prostate cancer, I've already said, I wouldn't go anywhere near it. I think it's an absolute menace. What about vaccines to protect against shingle, shingles? I, I got invited to have the vaccine, I think it must have been about four years ago. Uh, is it people over 70? Because that would have been about right. So four or five years ago, I looked up the systematic review. It showed that it uh, reduced my chances of developing shingles by about 50% which sounded good, so I went for it. Intervening, um, in the intervening year, I developed shingles. Now, uh, the, the, the data don't claim that it abolishes the, um, uh, the chance of getting shingles, um, but shingles is a bugger of a disease, I can tell you, it really is. And so when I looked up the treatments, there's really, the treatments are very unsatisfactory. Uh, you can take anticonvulsant drugs and antidepressant drugs. I didn't want to have systemic drugs. Then there are local drugs you can use. There's a local anesthetic, um, lignocaine, but none of them work particularly well, and it's a damn nuisance. Dog bite. Um, Jan, my wife and I, were about to go to Gaza um, last year and she was separating uh, the two dogs that live with us when they were fighting over a scrap of um, something that they wanted to eat and one dog lunged at the other but actually caught Jan and um, um, did a really nasty bite. You could see down to the bone of her forearm. Um, I looked up the evidence. They, unfortunately, they had quite a good Cochrane review on um, um, on human bites of people and how to manage those, but not the dog bites. There was a uh, there was a protocol there, but it still hasn't been filled in with a, uh, a full review. So that was unhelpful. Then, what about treatment of a fractured collarbone? Well, for those of you who are queasy, um, this is what I've got at the moment. I got um, I tripped over a sleeping policeman. Um, if you know what that is, um, it's a traffic calming thing. Um, and went a real perler and hit my right shoulder uh, on, the, on the ground. Um, I looked up, before I went up to casualty, I looked up um, uh, what was there. Um, all of the things referred to um, the middle third of the clavicle and what might be done uh, with bits of ironmongery that can be put in to help the healing. But mine wasn't. It was a, the, the, the the whole end had uh, come off, and so there was no difficulty in coming to a decision that I didn't want people um, operating on me uh, because it wasn't involving the the joint. 
But it shows you, you sometimes you don't get the answers you, you want from researchers. What do I want when there's no reliable, relevant evidence to guide decisions about my health care? So, I stress for purely selfish reasons, when the relative merits of alternative forms of care are uncertain, I want to be offered the opportunity to participate in properly controlled research. And I've been carrying around this card for a long time, as you'll see in sort of just below the middle. Invite me to participate in all randomized trials for which I'm potentially eligible. Now, that is entirely self-interest because if I go for treatment dis decided through randomization, I hedge my bets efficiently. There is no more efficient way to hedge my bets. But at the same time, I help to generate more, more knowledge, which may be relevant to me if I've got a chronic condition, may be relevant to other people. Now, if one wants to have some empirical evidence to justify this uh, position, we did a, a study which was published in Nature looking at the extent to which a new treatment is likely to be superior to an existing treatment. And what we found was new treatments on average are very slightly more likely to be superior than to be inferior to existing treatments. You'll see the, the symmetry of those graphs. I think there were five different, um, well, quite a lot of different cohorts we looked at. So, you know, given that the odds are that, going for randomization is not stupid in my view. So what trials have I actually been involved in? Well, I had a chronic unproductive cough and there are at least three different uh, reasons that that might be. One that was suggested to me might be bronchospasm. Um, and so I went for an N of 1 crossover comparison. That is, it's within me the comparison that's being made. So I had um, a, a, an inhaler, um, of ice, ice, whatever it was, you'll tell me what it was, I can't remember, but it, it was an inhaler of um, um, stuff. Uh, a placebo one, a placebo inhaler, but I didn't know which, which was which. And so I went on for about uh, six or seven months, alternating week on week. Something went wrong because I was actually, the, both of the, 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 the cough got better. But it turned out that both of the inhalers were placebo inhalers. <laughs> so that attempt at a, uh, a thing didn't work very well. Um, I'm on st a statin, advised by my trusty general practitioner that that's a good thing to do. But one of the, the uh, side effects of, of statins is sleep disturbances. And uh, my wife kept on complaining that I kept on not actually waking up, but talking in the middle of the night, and sometimes shouting, uh, and that it was getting really rather tedious. So we did a crossover trial with her iPad, which actually can record everything that goes on during a whole night. So there was blinded assessment of the outcome measure, and after, again, about six months, um, it appeared that the statins were, if anything, protecting my wife from these outbursts. There was no evidence that that was a sleep disturbance that uh, I could blame on the statins. Muscle weakness, um, it's, it's one of the things which many people complain of. Um, a, a number of N of 1 trials are going on at the moment. I tried to join them, but the only way in which I could have done so would be to go from Oxford to Bista to get all of the paperwork done and, and so on. In other words, even on something as simple as this, having a comparison of um, statins versus a placebo, because for this you do need a placebo, um, it's just very, very difficult. As far as par parallel group comparisons are known, um, pneumococcal vaccine, I participated in one of those. I complained about that because they didn't send me the results, which is very rude. It's discourteous. If researchers want to make friends with patients, they should engage them and give them the results of their efforts, or not give them if they don't want them, but at least they ought to be offered the opportunity. 
I wanted to get involved in a one on um, a very interesting trial that's being run from Dundee, um, looking at whether taking antihypertensive drugs in the morning is better than taking them in the evening. It's a very real and simple question to address. But again, trying to actually get past all of the bureaucracy to participate in that trial, eventually I gave up. Fibula fracture. Um, well, this is where I came across this uh, phenomenon. Um, I was on holiday. Has, has anyone here seen the film on Golden Pond? Yeah, one or two people. Anyway, we were on holiday in that house because it belongs to friends of ours, and I jumped into Squam Lake in New Hampshire, the place where it was too shallow, and I broke the bottom of my fibula like a twit. Uh, luckily, we went um, home the following day. We were due to go home, so not much of the holiday was um, displaced. Um, the local doctor had said that I would, he gave me a walking splint and said that the swelling would go down after a few days. I'd get put into a baloney plaster, walking plaster, and it would come off after six weeks. I went to the fracture clinic uh, in the um, John Radcliffe Hospital, which is the, where you go in Oxford, and um, the um, orthopedic surgeon there said, right, you can take that thing off for a start, referring to the walking splint. I said, yes, I know that. I was told by your colleague in New Hampshire that that would be the case, and then I'm expecting to go into baloney plaster. He said, no, you're not. Uh, you'll have double strapping, and you'll walk on it till it hurts, and then a bit more. And I said, well, couldn't you actually, um, as you disagree, couldn't you actually put me in a randomized trial and find out what the consequences are of these different uh, treatments that you're offering. And he said, um, randomized trials of people who are uncertain about whether or not they're right. Uncertain. <laughs> now, what's so silly about that attitude is that this is a very common fracture. I've been following this tale for 10 years now. There's still no good evidence to say which of these two approaches you should use. Or indeed, whether if you look at different outcomes, like muscle wasting or pain, you actually choose a different uh, intervention. But this is the, the reality. We've all got a choice to make in these circumstances. Either you acquiesce in the treatment uncertainties, or you address them. And if you ac acquiesce in them, you have ongoing clinical uncertainty. If you treat, in the context of a randomized trial, you get new knowledge. How can I, as a patient, other patients, and the public more generally become more engaged in obtaining reliable evidence to guide me in their treatment choices? Well, I think that part of the problems, I'm not going to enlarge on this now, are some very bizarre and indefensible positions taken by research ethics committees and by some research ethicists. Ten years after that article was published, with a philosopher, by the way, Julian Savalescu was the first author of that, um, we looked at it and it was no longer um, the same question. It was now, why are we still waiting for research ethics committees to behave more ethically? because they don't at the moment in some rather important respects. Patients continue to suffer and die unnecessarily because of under-regulation and over-regulation of research by research ethics committees and the influence of some ethicists. And so more needs to be done to actually call them to account. They're meant to be looking after the interests of we patients and the public more generally, and they're not doing a good job at the moment. We wrote this book for the public um, in 2006 and it went into a second edition in 2011 to try and raise the issues that I've tried to raise in this um, talk with you. It went down quite well but I like this um, um, this review in fact published in the Norwegian Medical Journal um, which starts this is an important scary and encouraging book I've tried to say some things which I hope may have astonished you and maybe scared some of you. Um, so
So, the action plan, the end of that book, says promote research on the effects of treatments, addressing inadequately answered questions about the effects of treatments which you regard are important. But only if the trial meets scientific and ethical principles that you agree to participate on condition that the study protocol has been registered and, the trial and, and made publicly available, that the protocol refers to the systematic reviews of existing evidence showing that the trial is justified and that you receive written assurance that the full study results will be published and sent to all participants who indicate they wish to receive them. This book's in 20 translations now, so that message is getting across, hopefully, to a wider group of people. But it was Andy Oxman from um, Oslo, he's an American actually, who had this brilliant idea, can we teach African primary school children to learn how to assess claims about the effects of treatments? There were key concepts which we wanted to try and teach them. New, but is it better? More isn't necessarily better. Earlier is not necessarily better. So we developed a list of, of 32 key concepts. 24 of them were judged by the primary school teachers to be within the grasp of their 10 to 11 year olds. Um, there was only one term available to us, so we tested the uh, thing on um, 12 key concepts. This is another example of more is not necessarily better. Had a lovely team of people from East Africa and from Norway. Me, I was very privileged to be um, part of the team. Um, and basically we were trying to uh, encourage the development of skepticism among these children. We did a randomized trial involving 10,000 children which showed that we had been able to make them better bullshit detectors when it came to assessing treatment claims. And we did the same for their parents with a podcast. They became better bullshit detectors. The one year follow up showed that the kids had retained their abilities, but not the parents. <laughs> so, um, here are the results. Um, all of those um, things on the right, these things up here, show these increases in ability that we were able to find. It got quite a lot of good write-ups, and in fact, BBC World actually did a program on it. Um, I'll leave you to read this, because it's the end of my talk, but it goes beyond medicine, um, because I think it is an issue that we need to be concerned about in these days to promote critical thinking about claims whether they are Trump's claims or anybody else's claims. We need a literate and informed public to save our democracies. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to have taken more of your time than I was allowed. And thanks very much for your talk. Um, I actually am a school teacher. Um, where can I get resources that I can use in the classroom about this? Okay, so all of the, if you go to informedhealthchoices.org, all of it's free. Free, downloadable. Who's doing replications? There's one in Spanish, for example. It's been, the, some of the material's been translated into, um, it's getting on for 10 different languages now. There's, interestingly, um, although the, some people at the Educational Endowment Foundation, which is a wonderful organization, 
have taken this a great interest in this and shown that the key concepts that we identified work for educational interventions as well. No one has actually taken up the idea of trying it out in, in uh, the UK. Uh, in Ireland, they're trying it out. Um, and I think that it's, it's relevant to, for you to know that the International School in Oslo um, has adopted the, the book which was prepared for primary school kids in Uganda as part of their curriculum, Lock, Stock and Barrel. They haven't translated it into examples about skiing and that sort of stuff. It's, it's a still with mangoes and mosquitoes and things. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, my name is Stefan. Uh, I am a policy officer at the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority. And one of the, I would say, exciting problems that we're tackling that are a bit bof baffling as well sometimes is um, that of unproven treatment add-ons. So these are uh, additional treatments um, on top of IVF that patients can purchase uh, in, in mostly private clinics, but also in some NHS clinics. And the trouble that we're facing apart from the fact that these are being offered uh, overall in, in this unproven manner is that patients continue to request and actually want them even though they know the evidence. So there is this desperate uh, desperation factor that makes patients often believe and be very susceptible to um, like unsubstantiated claims. And so we have tried to put out evidence, um, a more, more unbiased evidence and balanced evidence on, that, on, on, on the current state of the evidence, uh, meaning that we have a section on our website saying, here is the evidence, um, there is overall no effect, there is little effect, or uh, there is um, contradictory effects. What we found is that patients still request uh, treatment add-ons at some points, and uh, that raises for me the question, how do we get people to care about these findings and how do we actually make them understand what it means when there's a, no, uh, a non-significant or a harmful uh, result coming from research? Well, I think the first thing to say is I'm absolutely delighted that you have recognized this as an issue that needs to be um, addressed. Um, it's one, in terms of how one addresses it, you're far more likely to come up with um, feasible um, suggestions than I am. But just a couple of reflections on what you said. Um, it's very sad, isn't it, that um, I find it sad that I have to say that maybe the only way that is going to make a difference is to introduce a competitive element on price for these services. In other words, not just saying that there's no decent evidence on the basis of the research, but actually comparing different clinics, showing their success rates, and perhaps, I don't know, they would be difficult to interpret these comparisons, um, to, to encourage people who are wondering whether to spend, I don't know, the, the, some large amount of money, it would almost certainly be, on this rather than on some other aspect uh, of their lives uh, would be a bad investment. But I think you're facing a very difficult problem and so that's why it, within the NHS it ought to be easier. So for example, um, when laparoscopic treatment for colorectal cancer was being introduced, NICE recommended that it should only be used within the context of a um, randomized trial um, called the classic trial, I think, um, until more was known about the relative mer merits of open operation compared to laparoscopic. And in fact, as time went on, that evidence did become available and the laparoscopic approach um, was um, okayed by knife. NICE. Now, in the private sector, you can't do that um, uh, so easily. And indeed, NICE has only used that option, which it's had right from the beginning of NICE, since 1999, um, doesn't use it very often. But I think in a publicly funded um, health service, just as long as that remains, 
um, it's actually very important to, to um, constrain the introduction of unevaluated treatments until they have been um, properly evaluated. But I wish you well because you're, you're acting on behalf not only of the taxpayer but also of, of patients or couples um, uh, in holding the views that you hold. That's the way I would look at it anyway. So thank you for doing that. Who's going first? Um, thank you so much for your, for your talk. Um, I have a question about um, cost in healthcare, and I sometimes struggle in my mind to um, ethically justify rationing or, or kind of the evidence for, or, or using evidence like cost in healthcare. And I guess my question for you is um, taking the same line, if you're offered two treatments, one is much better than the other, but that treatment is much more expensive to the extent that it might deprive somebody of healthcare elsewhere. Which do, which do you choose? I'm, re I'm really interested to know the approach to this. And so my background is, is as a medical student and somebody who studied health economics. So, um, d does the name Archie Cochrane mean anything to you? Yeah. Okay. The reason I ask is that he went on a demonstration lobbying for uh, a national health service in the late 30s. And he had a banner which said, all effective care must be free. So the key word was effective. Now, um, as I mentioned to my colleague from Gaza earlier, they're spending money on colloids for resuscitation, which should not be spent. So there are, there's a substantial amount of um, scope for reducing expenditure on things which uh, are really not um, uh, delivering dividends from the investment in them. So the first thing to, to think about is what can we um, actually um, disinvest from? But if there's someone who's got a, an appalling neurological disease which looks like um, affecting them and disabling them for years perhaps, and there is some very expensive drug uh, which has been shown confidently to uh, improve their quality of life, I think it would be callous not to find the resources from somewhere to help such a person. In other words, you shouldn't be discriminated against because you've landed up having a disease for which an effective treatment has been found which happens to be very expensive. Almost always there's room for negotiation with the drug company to knock down their price, and this has happened on a number of occasions up until now. But you get, in, 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 uh, as well as that, you get the totally uh, indefensible situation where treatment for senile macular degeneration can be treated equally well by um, a very expensive drug and one which is the 20th of the cost. And the, 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 the manufacturers of the expensive one trying to defend the idea that it, um, treatment should be restricted to their, their drug. So it's appalling. Mind you, because this country really has only two manufacturing industries left, pharmaceuticals and armaments, very few governments are prepared to take on either of those uh, industries. So um, despite what's happening in Saudi Arabia, in Yemen at the moment and what's happening uh, in Gaza with um, British funded um, um, products, uh, that will go on without anyone making too much fuss about it. Thanks. Uh, I, I wonder if you could comment on the use of um, sort of personalised talking therapies for mental health treatment, where one might worry that encouragement to use only methods which have been uh, trialled in randomised controlled ways would mean that certain kinds of potentially effective treatments which are really personalised to patients just aren't susceptible to that kind of analysis and so would be ruled out if one were only to use treatments which had been assessed in that way. Well, I guess my response to you, I know a little bit about this, but cognitive behavioural therapy and indeed uh, um, variations on that have been shown in many controlled trials to be effective. 
So they, that category of drugs, uh, the ca category of um, talking therapies does. So does family therapy, which in fact is a listening therapy more than a talking therapy. It's certainly it's the family that does the talking. So I think you're in some senses underrating the work that has been done by psychologists and, and psychiatrists and social workers actually as well um, to tackle those. Now, you, you raise a point within it, though, which you said that um, it may be that um, treatment needs to be individualized, and that, in fact, it has to be individualized. Well, that actually, people would claim, that applies for drugs as well. So it's not the idea that that is a strange and unique thing for people who have um, mental uh, uh, pain. It's something which applies across, um, across the board. Um, you know, what was it about the oranges uh, that made them successful in James Lynn's experiment? Was it the peel? Was it the flesh? I don't know what it was. But anyway, something worked and it was worthwhile putting your money on oranges. And eventually the Admiralty got around to, to doing that. And it probably saved quite a lot of people from dying and may have helped um, us to win the Napoleonic Wars. Does that answer your question satisfactorily, or are there bits that you want to get back at me with? If you think of something, come, after, uh, come and um, yeah, sort me out afterwards. What, what was really nice is I got up to stand here to hear, <laughs> to hear Alexander say of my talk, it was all blindingly obvious, uh, <laughs> which it is. Uh, I guess it might be a bit of a follow-up, but um, when do you know to stop doing randomized control trials if for a, a future generation maybe uh, the treatments might be uh, differently effective? Um, so let me give you an example of a situation which is very close to my um, personal interest. Um, those of you who know the Cochrane Collaboration may be able to envisage the logo that um, the Cochrane Collaboration is based on. It's part of the face of this watch, in fact. Um, and what it shows is the first seven trials of um, steroids given to women who are expected to deliver their babies prematurely. And the first seven, the first one, in fact, was uh, done in New Zealand. It was already pr pr uh, provided very strong evidence. But something like 20 trials were done subsequently. And people might well have asked, um, what's the justification of inviting women to join placebo-controlled trials of st steroids when the, uh, the evidence was so overwhelming? Um, two years ago, I published something in the somewhere in the Cochrane system. I left the Cochrane collaboration a long time ago. Um, and the title of my piece was, Should the Cochrane Logo Be a, uh, Accompanied by a Health Warning? The reason was that people had been concerned that steroids weren't being used sufficiently widely across the world, and as a result, babies were dying from immaturity unnecessarily. So a big cluster randomized trial was, uh, was designed in mainly in developing countries, which is where the problem was, where um, one group of hospitals were assigned to a um, promotion of the uptake of this treatment. The others were kept as controls. Lo and behold, the controls had lower mortality than the uh, ones who had had the steroids. Probably due to infection, which hadn't been uh, an issue in the places where the trial had been done previously. WHO responded very promptly and very responsibly. It first of all, issued uh, a synopsis of these new data. It then commissioned 
um, additional trials in places where infection of the newborn might be more of a problem than it had been in Amsterdam and, New and uh, Auckland and other places where the, the main trials have been done. So when to stop doing trials, given that particular example, is, well, they haven't stopped even now, even though it seemed a couple of years ago that really people were on dodgy grounds ethically by doing more trials. So I think the decision of when to stop is always going to be difficult. I actually got um, someone called Peter Armitage, a wonderful medical statistician now in his 90s, to write about this because he had initially looked in the 40s and early 50s, he'd looked at statistical methods to try and decide whether um, a treatment, sh when a, a trial should be stopped or trials should not be, um, uh, no further trials should be used. And he pointed out that it's not something which you can sort out with statistics. It has all sorts of things uh, bearing in on it about the decision either to do an additional trial, like, like the ones for colloid versus crystalloid. People were not convinced that colloid was actually killing people. So they did further very well done trials which showed actually it wasn't that they were um, um, more dangerous than crystalloids, it was just that they didn't offer anything in terms of um, better survival, or better, fewer, uh, less morbidity. So it is, you, you've identified an extreme, I would say always an extremely difficult question to be certain about. One very brief, the last question brief. Did you get the... Um, what do you think of the potential of individual patient data meta-analysis to uh, assist in personalising therapies for patients? And what do you think the chances will be in using this method to do so? Right. Well, first of all, individual patient data meta-analyses have been very important already. If you take, for example, the individualised treatment of breast cancer, anti estrogen dr drugs... Um, could be expected to work in women who've got eastern receptors on their tumours. That, that would be the logic. Yet the assays for these um, receptors at the beginning of tamoxifen were very poor. And as a consequence, there was confusion even using the um, individual patient data. But that's an example of something which took some time to work out but what's important about the individual patient data is you have individual trajectories for, for every patient. You're not looking at a series of grouped analyses of group data. That said, tremendous advances have been made, I would say, on the basis of um, um, systematic reviews that haven't had access to individual patient data. So that's the first thing to say. Now, as far as individualized um, uh, treatment is concerned, personalised treatment, I think there's been massive hype with very little evidence that it's going to be the great um, new thing for people like me who have a fractured clavicle and are pretty certain that it's unlikely to be useful individualised data for that or even with the drug uh, treatment. I would, that's why I go for the N of 1 trials. They are absolutely related to my reactions to whatever the, the um, intervention is. The trouble is, getting them done and getting access to them remains extremely difficult. They ought to be a part of normal care. In some senses they are. You know, a general practitioner will say, well, well let's try this drug, see how you do on that, and you find that no discernible pro progress is made with that drug. Right, let's try this one. It's a crossover, but it's an informal crossover, and so we don't actually have the data collected in such a way that it can be most useful. So I agree with, in some senses, the motivation of those people who are hyping uh, the idea that personalised uh, treatment is going to be around the corner. I resent the fact that they ignore the efforts currently made by general practitioners and other doctors 
to give personalized treatment already and I think that they're, they have not thought sufficiently about what they are promoting and how achievable it is. Does that in some way come to me? Right.